out to the main course the logging museum. Today we're going to take a close look at the museum's steam lombard log hauler. Lombard did not invent the caterpillar track. What he did do, he was the very first person to develop a practical working system that he actually marketed. So this is the system right here. We have a typical set of crawler tracks and you'll notice Lombard used a set of roller chains and there's a set of roller chains on each side of this runner and that's what supports the weight of the machine. And as awkward as it seems, and as weird as it seems, it, it, it functions very, very, very well. It's actually a very smooth running machine. These tracks are about 16 inches wide, which is needed because the machine in operating order is around 19 tons. So one of the crucial jobs of running a steam Lombard was that of the steersman. He'd sit out front here, right in front of the smoke box, so his back was roasted. And he had this big iron steering wheel, which he gripped with a death grip. Now, unlike your car, which probably has precision steering, and you could turn on a dime, the steering on this machine is 42 to 1. It takes a lot of turns to get it to turn. And if you look down here, you'll see that this machine right now is equipped with steel wheels. And that's because we run it in the summer. All steam lombards were set up with sled runners, with skis, because they're made to operate in the wintertime. They're made to haul long, long sled trains, up to 300 tons of log. So here's a set of skis that originally would have been under the front of the lombard. And like I said, these machines were designed to be used in the wintertime. And for the sake of being able to operate and demonstrate here at the museum, we installed steel wheels. That worked. So this particular machine was made somewhere between 1908 and 1910. We're not sure of the exact year. What we do know is that at the end of the 1925 winter hauling season, it was abandoned in a place called Knowles Brook on the upper St. John River. Later on in the late 60s, it was salvaged and uh, eventually wound up here at the museum in the 1980s. After 30 years of restoration in 2014, it finally came back to So the heart of this machine is our steam cylinders, and these measure 9-inch bore, 10-inch stroke. There's one on each side, and it's rated at about 100 horsepower. And yet, because of the gearing, this machine can pull over 300 tons. So when we're looking at our cylinder, we have our steam comes in, works the piston back and forth. We've got our connecting rod back to a, a jack shaft and flywheel. And if we look back in here, you'll see that there's a gear case. And there's a pinion gear, and then there's what they call the compensating gear. Back originally, when Lombard developed his very first machine in 1900, these cylinders, were, these connecting rods were connected directly to the, the, uh, the main shaft, to the sprockets. It was a crank sprocket. And what he found is that the machine wouldn't turn. So he had to come up with some way of slowing one track down, just like in a car, how the inside wheel slows down when you take a corner. And that's what the compensating gear does. That, in turn, drives a jack shaft, so we have our chain sprocket, and that goes all the way back to our main drive sprocket, which is back here. Now, what's interesting about Lombards is that it's not a rigid track system. Down in here, there's a pivot. You can actually see it right here, this big pivot. And this track system, it's allowed to move independently like this, so it'll follow the terrain. Plus, there's a very crude system of springs, so it, the whole machine is actually sprung, so it can negotiate some rough terrain. So being steam-powered, this, this machine looks like a locomotive on crawler tracks, but it's actually a dedicated design machine. These boilers, the boiler is made by Ames Iron, Iron Works in Oswego, New York. We have a saddle tank, much like a tank locomotive, that holds 425 gallons of water. And that will take you probably 7 to 10 miles, depending upon the terrain and what you're hauling. So this machine is wood-fired, and one quart of wood will take you about 7 miles. So here we have a schematic that was created by Bill Lynch years ago, and it helps us explain how this machine works. So here we have our boiler, we have our fire in the firebox, the hot gases from the, uh, from the fire are drawn through the fire tubes, and then up the stack. And your exhaust steam coming from your cylinders also goes up the stack as well. And that creates a vacuum. So the harder the engine works, the more draft. The more draft, the more air is sucked through the fire, the hotter the fire is going to be. Here we can see our steersman and the skis. They used to say that the steersman job was the dangerous of all. But when you think about it, these machines cost about $5,500 back when they're brand new, which is about the cost of a new skidder today, a couple hundred thousand. 
So they did everything possible to make the roads wide, smooth, they would follow brooks and rivers, anything they could to, to, to keep the machine. Here we are in the cab of our steam lumbar log hauler, and let's talk a little bit about the controls of this beast and how we actually get it to go. So here's the back end of our boiler, here's our throttle quadrant. As we move this back and forth, we can control the amount of steam going to the cylinders. Down in the corner, under Chuck's hat, we have the, uh, the reverse quadrant. Basically what this does, it changes the position of the valves in the cylinder in relation to the stroke of the piston. So for instance, if I move the lever all the way forward, the machine's going to go forward. If I pull the lever all the way back, the machine's going to go in reverse. There's also intermediate notches that allow us to cut off the steam early so we can actually conserve water and, and fuel. Uh, here we have our injectors so that we can put water into the boiler. Uh, rather than using like a high pressure pump, what these rely on is velocity. So you have steam hitting a solid water column through a venturi and it forces the check valves and it goes into the boiler. Uh, but most important, we also have our water glass over here, our sight gauge. Tells us the level of the water above the, uh, the uh, crown sheet, which is extremely important. We also have tricocks here that we can use to also test our water level as well. Like any machine, it has to be lubricated. The pistons need to be lubricated, the valves need to be lubricated. What we have here is a Hills McCann oiler. Uh, this is mechanical, so there's an arm that actually runs off the valve motion, so it pumps oil. So as we're sitting stationary or fired up, there's not a lot of draft coming through the boiler. So we have the blower, which is this little valve right here. And I'm not going to really turn it because it's hot. <laughs> but what that does, it lets a little bit of steam go up through the smoke box. And that helps create a draft and a vacuum that helps to draw the, the air up through the fire bin. The lever right here, we actually have the dampers. These are doors on each side of the end of the fire box that open up and allow more air to go through. It's very important with the boiler, control the flow of air because too much air and you're going to chill the tubes and it's going to cause expansion and contraction in the boiler and that will eventually cause leaks. Another important item we have is right here. This is for our cylinder cocks. What this does is because when we're sitting stationary then there's not a lot of steam going through the cylinders, uh, the water, whatever steam happens to be in the cylinders, turns to condensate or water. The water doesn't compress. If we tried to move this engine with the, uh, with the cylinder cocks closed, that water, once the piston hits it, it could blow out the end of a cylinder, it could bend the piston rod and many other things. So what we always do, we have those open for a couple of revolutions, blow any condensate out, and then we can close them. So here we've got our fire. Right now we're just kind of letting it coast a little bit. Now you think when you're throwing wood into a fire that you just chuck it in. But really, that's not what you do. What you're trying to do is fill holes and trying to keep your fire as even as possible. And why we fill the holes is we want to make sure that there's no excess air being drawn up through the fire bed and chilling the tubes. And we're clear on that side. The throttle. Close the cylinder cocks. 